in this presentation. We ask for your presence with us as we go through this little study here just now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to just take 10, 15 minutes here and look at a few things because there has been some questions in regard to uh, the relationship of the spirit of prophecy to the modern versions. So I'll just share a few points here with you on that. And this, uh, this little concern goes back quite a few years uh, to the time of uh, Dr. Benjamin Wilkinson, who was the Dean of Theology at the Washington Missionary College. And he published a book in 1930. Oh, I'm sorry. Pardon me, I got to go back up where I was again. That's I started to speak and I didn't even notice that it wasn't even on your screen up here. I apologize. Okay, here we are. So this this issue of the modern versions uh, and its relationship to the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of prophecy's relationship to the modern versions is what this little segment is about. And it begins really in earnest uh, back in the 1930s when uh, Dr. Benjamin Wilkinson published a book that was called Our Authorized Bible Vindicated. And he was defending the King James Version of the Bible and there was stiff reaction uh, to that book. And... Uh, there was a book that was anonymously, you know, like the book Questions on Doctrine that was published anonymously, uh, written anonymously. So this book was written anonymously, and the name of the book was Objections to Our Authorized Bible Vindicated. And uh, anyway, Wilkinson wrote a response to that then in another book. And... Uh, Wilkinson said, it is of course well known that our standard publications in English, oh, excuse me, this, this is what the authors uh, in objections to Wilkinson's book said, it is of course well known that our standard publications in English since 1901 use the two versions with impartiality and as equally authoritative. Now the two versions of which the anonymous authors referred to were the 1881 Revised Version and the American Revised Version. And Dr. Wilkinson responded with another book, which is almost more interesting than his first book, and it was called Answers to Objections to Our Authorized Bible Vindicated, in which he said, I must say to you, brethren, that this is not well known, neither is it the truth. <laughs> Many of our ministers do not regard the Revised Version as of equal authority with the King James. So, and, and when I was uh, studying this probably about 20, 25 years ago now, uh, I just had to know for myself. And uh, because you'd hear this side of the story, you'd hear that side of the story. So what is the actual facts of this? Well, so I started to go through the books. And I chose out for uh, my cross-section of study five of the big books from the um, Conflict of the Ages series, which you see here on the graph, The Great Controversy, Patriarchs and Prophets, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, and Prophets and Kings. I didn't even rely on our index that we have that's been produced for this material. I went through these books page by page to see how the texts were being used and what, who was being quoted. And so what you have here on the chart is the actual data that is accumulated from that little endeavor. And what you'll see there, you'll see a, on the first column there, the total number of references. For example, for Great Controversy, we have a total number of Bible references that is uh, 857. 848 of those are from the King James Version, and nine are from the Revised Versions. 
And with patriarchs and prophets, we have a total number of references of 1140. And uh, 1110 of those are from the King James Version. And you can, as you go right down through those columns then, you can see how many are the total number of references and how many are from the King James Version. So we go down through all five of those books and we have a total of 4,511 references total from the scriptures. And uh, out of that 4,511, 4,415 are from the King James Version of the Bible. 96 are from the Revised Version and the American Revised Version. I also, in my study, took these six different books uh, because they're more of the pastoral nature, right? And so I wanted to see what was the usage of the King James Version versus the modern versions in the testimonies. And I started with uh, volume four because it was in 1881 that volume four was written and produced, and it was in 1881 that the English Revised Version was produced. So that's why I use that as the starting point. And incidentally, um, this is where the big thing is. People say, they always, the critics will always say, well, she used the Revised Version, and they're referring to the English Revised Version or the American Revised Version. They never talk about, do you know that there was about 100 versions of the Bible in the English language produced in the years that Ellen White was alive. And virtually all of those, virtually most of them were not used at all. There was just a, a little over a half a dozen, less than a dozen that were used and most of those very sparingly. The ones that were used the most are the ones we're addressing right here in this chart. But again, you can see that in uh, volume four of the testimonies, um, she didn't use any new versions at all. In volume five, none at all. In volume six, one reference from the modern versions. Volume seven, two references from the modern versions. And as Clint was mentioning earlier, that there's references made to the Psalms. And basically that was because it was kind of an open verse layout and it was just a little more readable. That's all. There's nothing wrong with something being more readable, is there? I mean, uh, and that's why the Psalms were used. And she used it because it had been suggested to Ellen White to do so. And otherwise she probably wouldn't have even done that. Volume nine again, after volume eight, volume nine, it's back to not using the modern versions at all. So Ellen G. White's use of the new versions in the spirit of prophecy was extremely limited with a preference solidly in favor of the King James Version and this not because of a lack of versions. Our tally shows a list of no less than 58 versions before 1913. In the period of 1850 to 1900, some 50 new translations into the English of the New Testament or the entire Bible appeared. Were you aware that there were that many versions of the Bible then? But it's interesting that for most of those, almost all of those weren't even used at all. Well, contrast the statistics being compile, compiled from the actual analysis of the writings under discussion here. Notice the statements that's used to describe Ellen White's usage of the modern versions. It says, and these are just kind of sentence fragments, I admit, but it, it conveys the sentiment, the fact of her frequent and generous use of such versions. Ellen White made such generous liberal use of non-King James Version translations available in her day. She ignores the King James Version rendering, pointedly preferring instead the reading of the RV. Ellen White's use of the then available new translation shows widespread reference to them. Well, in my study of that, 
when I came to the end of my little study on that, it took me a while to do that. <laughs> uh, there must, let's see, what was there? There was, there was 4,500 pages there. So we've got, um, I don't know how, 45, I don't have the pages there on that. But anyway, it was a lot of pages. <laughs> it, took, it took some time to do. But I satisfied uh, my curio curiosity on that issue. Is it really uh, the usage of the spirit of prophecy, does it really correlate with these statements that we read here, frequent and generous? The frequent and generous, it translates down to about 1.5% of the time. That's what it does. And um, so what we see there just on the face of it was that she wasn't necessarily opposed to using another version, but you can tell that she would use the King James Version as really the final authority. Now, because Ellen White used modern versions in certain carefully selected instances, that has come to be a sort of inferred blank check endorsement for currently used modern versions that did not even exist in her day. Is that fair? I, I don't think that's fair to do that. And by the way, this is very informal here. We're just filling in some time. <laughs> so I'll just go until I have to quit. Five minutes or so yet. Okay, he says... 10 minutes, so that's what we'll do. <laughs> Higher critical scholars will criticize the King James Version and the received text behind it and yet enlist the writings of the spirit of prophecy to lend credibility to their criticisms. We, in turn, ask several questions in response to a number of their criticisms. So if people are making statements about the spirit of prophecy support for the modern versions, is it not fair for us to ask questions back in regards to the statements they have made? So I shall do that. So before 1881, when the revised version was introduced, does the spirit of prophecy say we needed a new version of the Bible? Does it say we need a new translation? See, all these things are being uh, inferred. Does it say we need better scholarship? Does the spirit of prophecy say that we need better manuscripts to work from? And does it say we need earlier Greek manuscripts to work from? Now, while I'm asking these questions, I want you to be searching your memory banks where it says in the spirit of prophecy these kinds of statements. Does it ever use the derisive tone against the King James Version that many scholars with an Adventism use today? Does the spirit of prophecy intimate in any way whatever that the King James Version has, quotes, grave defects and that these defects are so many and so serious as to call for a revision of the English translation? Does the spirit of prophecy say that the modern versions are closer to what the original authors wrote than the King James Version? Does the spirit of prophecy say that the King James Version is not final authority? Again, I'm asking, where in the spirit of prophecy would it say that the King James Version is not final authority? Does it say that using the King James Version only is a human tradition? Does the spirit of prophecy say that using the King James Version only is, only is a utilizing circular reasoning? Does the spirit of prophecy say that the King James Version references to the names and titles of Jesus shows an expansion of piety? Does it say that Mark 16, 9 through 20 does not belong in the scriptures? Well, I know the spirit of prophecy doesn't say that because the spirit of prophecy quotes virtually every one of those verses <laughs> from the King James Version of the Bible. Does it say we do not know which version is correct on Mark 16, 9 through 20? Does the spirit of prophecy say that 1 John 5, 7 is not genuine and does not belong in the Bible? Does it say that Ellen White saw no danger lurking in the Greek text that lies behind the two versions? Does it say that the manuscripts Aleph and B are more ancient and most reliable? And by the way, if you were here on the presentation of the Waldenses, 
and the Waldensian background of the King James Version and the Geneva Bible, you would know the answers to a lot of these questions that are being posed here. Does it say that the Waldenses started with Peter Waldo in the 12th century? Well, we know what the answer to that is, don't we? Does the spirit of prophecy say that the received text behind the King James Version is a conflated text? And does it say if you use the King James Version only and you also believe in the spirit of prophecy, it will leave you exposed to a great risk of a crisis of faith? Does the spirit of prophecy say only the autographs could resolve the question as to which variant reading is the correct reading? Does it say that the King James Version is an expanded text? Does it caution readers of the King James Version that they are reading an expanded text? Does the spirit of prophecy say that the Waldenses had only the Latin Vulgate? And does it say that the Gospels or any portion of the Bible came down to us via oral tradition? We know where, what the situation is on this, where the spirit of prophecy really does stand on this. Does it say that modern Bible translators, quotes, have access to more accurate ancient Bible manuscripts than the King James Version translators had? Again, if you read the chapter in the Great Controversy, uh, the Waldenses, we know what the answer to that question is. It says right in that chapter, just as plain as can be, that they had their Bible was unadulterated, and this made them the objects of Rome's wrath. Where in the spirit of prophecy do we find the sentiment expressed, I am uncomfortable with the principle on which the translation, speaking of the King James Version, is based? And where does it state that there are four King James Version translation errors that led pioneer Adventists astray? That we are in error in arriving at uh, October 22, 1844. Does the spirit of prophecy say that the King James Version was based on late manuscripts that had accumulated numerous scribal errors? Does it say the King James Version misrepresents the Hebrew text? And where does the spirit of prophecy warn that the King James Version is, quotes, a translation that was never intended to be used in the 21st century? That statement was made by a very well-known name within Adventism today. He travels around and he speaks a lot. So we'll leave it at that. A uh, little thought there, a few questions to ask. And I only ask those questions simply because there's all kinds of statements that are made like those that are suggested in those questions. Question, statement after statement after statement. And it's easy to lob these statements out there like that. But once in a while, it's nice to have a venue where you actually ask the question back in return. Where is it? And I can tell you uh, from my reading and study, you won't find an affirmative answer for any of those questions in the spirit of prophecy that is insinuated. Not a one on the contrary. So...